Good evening, everyone. I'm Trey Johnson, and welcome to Museum After Hours. I'm sure most of you know by now, but the Kansas Museum of History is currently undergoing massive renovations. However, we are still here providing excellent programming for you. Our state archives are still open, as well as the Capitol and our state historic sites. We are pleased to have Dr. Alex Redcorn with us tonight to speak about education in indigenous peoples. Dr. Redcorn serves as an assistant professor of educational leadership, coordinator of indigenous partnerships, co-chair of the indigenous faculty and staff alliance, executive director of the Kansas Association for Native American Education and program coordinator for the indigenous educational leadership graduate certificate. Dr. Redcorn's efforts are focused on building capacities for native nations to take more prominent roles in the education of their citizens. One of the best benefits of programming like this is being able to pose questions to our guests. So be sure to ask your questions in the chat or the Q&A button so Dr. Redcorn can address them after the presentation. While Kansas is home to four federally recognized native nations, as well as Haskell Indian Nations University, Kansas's historic status as Indian territory has created a scenario in which our state has an ongoing relationship with American Indian peoples and nations from Kansas and beyond. Yet, Kansans often find it difficult to understand the complex existence of the modern American Indian due to educational systems that amplify narrow, stuck-in-the-past stereotypes. This evening, Dr. Redcorn will walk us through some core issues found in our educational systems as they relate to representations of indigenous peoples, seeking to answer the question, where is the contemporary American Indian? So let's all give a warm welcome to Dr. Alex Redcorn. I lost my mute button there for a second. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you for that. I just uh, imagined a big old round of applause after you if you said <laughs> yeah, explosive. So I'll, just, I'll just roll with it. So I appreciate the introduction. I appreciate the time um, and opportunity to be here and talk to everyone. And so, um, yeah, as as he talked about, uh, I'm going to talk about education and indigenous peoples and where is the contemporary Indian, which is kind of a fundamental issue that spreads across more than just education. And so I think one of the key starting points to think about while a lot of what I'm going to talk about is education themed tonight. Um, there is, uh, this, this spreads out across lots of institutional um, places that help people understand different kinds of people in the world. And so uh, without further ado, I'll just get started. And I just want to double check, can everybody see my, um, or can you see my screen, my share screen? Yep, we sure can. All right, well, let's get going then. Um, again, appreciate the time here tonight and the, uh, the opportunity to talk about this. So first off, who am I? Um, so my name is uh, Alex Redcorn. I'm a citizen of the Osage Nation. I'm from the Tsijuash Dage, uh, which is the Gentle Sky Peacekeeper Clan of the, the Osage community. And my family is from the Oaxacaling District near Pahuska, Oklahoma. Um, some people might know Pahuska, Oklahoma for the Pioneer Woman, uh, but the, the Osage have been there quite a long time before the Pioneer Woman set up the mercantile there. But uh, yeah, so um, I'm a former social studies teacher. So I started out as social studies at Kansas University. So um, rock chalk, um, but then I went to K-State and got an educational leadership doctorate. So I guess I have um, something to root for in both football and basketball seasons. Well, all right, so uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and get started. So that's kind of uh, who I'm where I come from. Oh, and also uh, this at the top, uh, my Osage name is Samoy. And so uh, that, that was given to me um, as a young, as a young uh, kid. And uh, that's, that's part of our cultural processes is receiving your Osage name. And Wahoing is Osage word for family, and this is my family. And so this is us at our Ilonshka, um, which is celebrated throughout June in three districts of the Osage Nation and um, in Oklahoma. Um, but the Osage have a long history in Kansas. And actually, this ceremony started during the process of us transitioning out of Kansas um, into Oklahoma. And these are uh, some of our nieces and nephews and my kids. Um, and uh, yeah, so... I'll go ahead and move forward. So, which term should I use? This is a this is a topic that comes out at the beginning of conversations quite a bit, and so uh, the terms that tend to be on the table are Indian American, Indian Native American, Native First Nations, Indigenous, and then tribally specific terms. 
And then you also have tribe, tribal, tribal nations, and native nations. So we got a lot of terms that we're working with here. And a lot of people want to try to do the right thing. Um, and I wish I could give a straightforward answer of like, hey, this is the most perfect way to answer this question. But the thing is, these things, these terms get used in different communities as you move across um, different political environments, as you move across different um, academic environments. And so what I'll leave you with is the world is starting to move towards indigenous. And whenever possible, um, use tribally specific terms, because um, when we tend to lean on American Indian, Native American, these broad terms too often, what we're losing is the cultural individuality of what it means to be Osage, Ka, Cherokee, and all those things. And so um, I've also been coached by some of my um, uh, I'll call them academic elders uh, to lean towards native nations and talk about um, uh, tribes, not only in the context of because uh, the word tribe kind of evokes like a different understanding of what we are. And we are, in fact, nations and um, sovereign governments. That's a really important part of this um, talk that I'm giving today is when we talk about American Indians, a lot of times uh, we lean towards um, American Indians are just another race or ethnicity. and for a starting point, and these are screenshots from the National Congress of the American Indians, a, a PDF that they put out for anybody that wants to kind of read up on the basics of tribal governance. Um, tribal treaties were signed between tribal nations and other governments. And um, a lot of times people don't think about this and the fact that when you're a member of a native nation, you actually have citizenship in a political body that separates them from the typical broad multiculturalism conversations. And so when we think about terms like federal state, tribal nation or tribal citizens are members of tribal governments, state governments, federal governments. And um, we're this can be a little bit complex. Um, and what that means is going to change from every single um, different community. Uh, but it's really important as a starting point to think along these lines um, and think of American Indians as not just um, a race, ethnicity type demographic. They are members of citizens, they're citizens of native nations. And that's a really important uh, starting point. So uh, pop quiz, um, basic knowledge about American Indians. I do this with everybody. I do it with third graders. I do it with teachers in training. I do it with general public. Um, and if it feels like these first two questions are a trap, they kind of are because most people know how to answer these. I say most. I assume a lot of people, most everyone can answer this. But how many states are in the United States and how many original colonies made up what is now the U.S.? And everybody can sing in their head. Um, we got 50 nifty United States and 13 original colonies. And so that's kind of 101 social studies in the United States of America. And that is very common knowledge and most elementary students can tell you that. So also as a starting point, what do we know about native people and native nations? When we ask the question, how many native nations are found across the United States? And people can feel free to use the chat if they would like. Um, but we tend to have a wide variety of answers. Um, and given the context of how I'm presenting, I won't wait for uh, answers, but basically um, I tend to get answers from like the 15 to the 50 to the 200, 250. And more often than not, nobody can answer this question or get close, but every once in a while you got some people who can. And the answer is 574 federally recognized native nations. So one of my starting points, the reason I start with this type of stuff is not to make everybody feel like, oh, I don't know anything, is basically to point out how little we learn about Indian country, about um, American Indians in the United States, and the fact that we can answer these questions, but we can't, uh, we can answer basic questions about how many states and how many original colonies, but a lot of people don't even know where to start when they're answering that simple question about Native nations. Um, moving forward, a lot of people, then the secondary question is, how many tribes are located in Kansas now? So how many federally recognized tribes? Now, there, this can get nuanced um, because there are tribes that never relinquish territories and there's tribes that still have plots of land in Kansas. So that can get a little tricky. But generally speaking, um, people, uh, when you say how many, tribes are how many tribes are located in Kansas now, um, a lot of people who graduate high school in Kansas cannot say that the Kickapoo tribe of Kansas, the Prairie Band Potawatomis, the Sac and Fox, and the Iowa tribe of Kansas and Nebraska are still located in Kansas. Um, and they are located in the upper northeast of Kansas. And um, people who graduate from high school in this region 
most often can't say this. And so these are really important things that we have to think about when we think about um, we have to come to we have to reckon with what did we learn about American Indians? Um, and I waited for the land acknowledgement till uh, after because I didn't want to ruin the pop quiz, but also in the introduction, um, there were four tribes they talked about. So that was already out the table, but that's all right. Um, but when we talk about the importance of land acknowledgements, um, land acknowledgements have kind of a mixed understanding right now in the um, in the landscape of the education world. Um, but I think um, I interpret, this is my personal interpretation, that land acknowledgements are not meant to just make people feel terrible about the kind of complicated past that they inherited. Um, I'm an educator, so I think about land acknowledgements as an educational tool to teach about local place-based history. And so if we make it regular to do land acknowledgements, we're, it's not hard for people to know that these, these native nations are still present and that they exist still today and how many tribes are in Kansas and how many tribes were in Kansas type of thing. And so um, since we're talking about Kansas broadly, um, I'm going to I'm going to reference the the K State land acknowledgement, but um, this is how it's read. But I prefer to let our Native American students at K State um, answer this and, and go through this land acknowledgement. As the first land grant institution established under the 1862 Morrill Act, we acknowledge that the state of Kansas is historically home to many Native nations, including the Kaw, Osage, and Pawnee, among others. Furthermore, Kansas is the current home to four federally recognized Native nations, the Prairie Band Potawatomi, the Kickapoo Tribe of Kansas, the Iowa Tribe of Kansas and Nebraska, and the Sac and Fox Nation of Missouri in Kansas and Nebraska. Many Native nations utilized the Western Plains of Kansas as their hunting grounds, and others, such as the Delaware, were moved through this region during Indian removal efforts to make way for white settlers. It's important to acknowledge this, since the land that serves as the foundation of this institution was, and still is, stolen land. We remember these truths because K-State's status as a land-grant institution is a story that exists within ongoing settler colonialism and rests on the dispossession of indigenous peoples and nations from their lands. These truths are often invisible to many. The recognition that K-State's history begins and continues through indigenous contexts is essential. Please remember these truths because we still remember so um what i like about this land acknowledgement is the fact that it's it's an opportunity to connect our the land grant history which some people call the land grab history um actually more people are calling it land grab history and for anybody that um is interested if you just google land grab universities there's a whole article in a database that can take you to uh, Kansas State University's history as a land grant institution and tell you exactly where the plots of land came from that were granted to Kansas State University um, that were taken from the Kaw Nation. And so the Kaw people, um, the Kaw people's land in treaties that um, I'll actually show here in a second, um, were what funded the founding of Kansas State University. And that's just that's just an awkward truth that we all are increasingly working to kind of deal with as we work through um, kind of how that unfolds in a modern um, educational context. Um, people who know me like to, or they know that I like to use the word entanglement. I consider these are one of our settler colonial entanglements that we all um, had to work through as an institution. Um, and while I got your attention on land acknowledgements, I just wanted to point out that our Kansas Association for Native American Education just released a toolkit. Um, there's a QR code there that'll take you to it. Um, and we're getting lots and lots of requests um, in in the last couple of years about land acknowledgements. How do I do a land acknowledgement? Can you help me do a land acknowledgement? And so we created a toolkit to help people walk through um, how to do a land acknowledgement. And one of the key things in there um, is that we're moving towards like, let's move beyond making land acknowledgements as just a recitation of like, hey, check, we did our diversity thing and now we're moving on and moving towards um, action what are the actionable things that we are actually doing as an institution? And so um, I really like the idea of land acknowledgements as a tool, um, because if you think about 
having students at any layer of education, whether it's elementary, middle, secondary, or higher ed, um, the process of going through and figuring out whose land this is and what are the treaties and where they go um, is a very important educational process to understanding our locale and our history as Kansas. And um, I actually am a little bit jealous of people doing land acknowledgements in other states because it can sometimes be a little bit more simple than Kansas because Kansas was Indian territory and all these nations were here before. And this is not even a complete list, but the map on the left, you have Pawnee, Kanza, Osage, Cheyenne, Arapaho, Kiowa, and Comanche. Um, and then you have all these nations that were moved through on the right. Um, and the biggest and most notable ones that you would probably recognize are those same nations. Some of those same nations were reduced um, in their land size, but um, for a lot of people along the I-70 corridor, uh, number seven here, the Shawnee um, are really, uh, you see it everywhere. So um, you'll hear people say uh, American Indians are everywhere yet nowhere at the same time. And you can go to Shawnee Mission Schools and then um, go out to Topeka, which is in Shawnee County and all those types of things. And you could never really truly be aware who the Shawnee people were and where they are now. Um, and actually we're doing a workshop where the chief of the Shawnee tribe um, is actually presenting tomorrow um, at a teacher workshop at KU. So it's really important to think about whose land you're on and Osage and Kaw land sessions on, on, I'll say this part of the state because I'm actually in the Kansas City area, even though I work for Manhattan, I uh, work, work out of Manhattan. And um, basically um, the two original native nations that we need to think about are the Kaw nation and the Osage. And those are the original inhabitants of this, most of this half of the state. And you can see um, that these land sessions here, you see this line right here, matches up with these Osage sessions here. And so um, the call land sessions were right here, and that's actually an oversimplification as well. But understanding these histories, I think is really important. Um, but as you'll see, those histories aren't the only thing that we need to be talking about. So when we talk about education and how does the US portray American Indians, um, you know what? The internet has all the answers, right? And so uh, we'll just Google it and see what Google tells us. So these are screenshots from a Google image search from uh, probably about five years ago for me. My algorithms are a little bit different now, so they don't really show uh, the exact same thing. But I would encourage you to look on your local computer and your local Google search and um, explore this and see what shows up. But we search for something simple as Mexican-American, and this is what shows up. We search for something as simple as Asian American. This is what shows up. And then we search for African American. And this is what we see. And then we search for Native American or American Indian. And this is what happens. So as we think about this, and we don't have the most interactive platform here, but I ask you to reflect on what do you notice? And you'll notice that a lot of these are sepia tone, black and white, a lot of headdresses. And um, this is the dominant image that is the American Indian in, Indian in the psyche of most Americans. So as an educator, I like to think, why? Where does this come from? Um, there's lots of reasons. But if you look at the actual research, basically, um, if you go search on Google and Bing, and I don't know who all is using Bing still, but this uh, study was from 2015. So, uh, but 95% of Google images came back in that stuck in the past image, that stereotype, and 99% of Bing images. So basically the great majority of what's out on the internet tagged with American Indian or Native American is that stuck in the past image. And so it brings up this idea about curriculum in our schools. And this paragraph sums up a lot. And it's some, it, it kind of talks about how we see them as welcoming European settlers, joining them in a Thanksgiving celebration and guiding them as they explore the West, being massacred as settlers pushed westward and finally being removed, by, removed and subdued by Andrew Jackson. And after the Trail of Tears, American Indians disappear from the pages of our textbooks and the curriculum. And for our students, American Indians are museum exhibits. So I think this is a really important phrase, that last phrase, for our students, American Indians are museum exhibits. So I like to share how I ended up at the American Museum of Natural History. And if we think first and foremost, 
where are the American Indians in the museum categories? And they're sitting there alongside the dinosaurs and um, not necessarily in different places. Now, this is changing in the modern landscape. The museum world is, is evolving. I would, I would, I'm not, I don't come from the museum world strongly. Um, clearly I know what museums are and I go to a lot of museums, but um, it's, it's, I think it's safe to say that there's a there's a variety of how museums are addressing this issue and lots of museums are working to evolve past that. But there's a story in this museum where I was going around and I was I was um, just perusing and I I came across something that that was a this old sacred object, an old Osage sacred object. And and I. I wasn't supposed to be there um, if you follow certain, I don't think I was supposed to be there. I didn't really know what I was looking at. And there's a lot of things that I, um, that were kind of problematic with that object being displayed how it was, uh, at least as far as I've been taught um, in, in my home community. So this idea that Indians and museums are kind of like the stuck in the past imagery also kind of um, um, is part of that whole landscape. But I come from the education world and one of the most important um, studies that came out in 2015 talked about how 87% of social studies standards on American Indians across the entire country, so a 50 state scan, the social studies standards guide all instruction in those states. 87% um, of them are situated in a pre 1900 context. So, by design, that's what American Indian, or that's what all students are supposed to learn about that image, that stuck in the past image for the most part. Lots of states are have done some um, reform, and there's a lot of states that are kind of moving forward and evolving from this. But that's a really important kind of issue that we're working with. And so when a teacher goes to um, teach for the first time, they have classroom and they're looking for um, like, hey, I got these social studies standards and I got this textbook. I got so these are my re my main resources. How do I start um, developing materials? Well, uh, long story short, textbooks and supplemental teaching materials basically had the exact same thing. Um, a lot of disappearing natives after 1900. And as we keep kind of moving forward, you think about early childhood and the need for books. And so what do students learn? What do early, what do elementary students learn uh, when looking at books? And um, these are, so the, the text on the left isn't directly aligned with the text on the right because the text on the left is 2016 and the text on the right is, or the image on the right is 2018. But for the most part, um, of 3,400 books published in 2016, only 35 were about natives, or around 1%, and eight of those 35 books were written by native authors. So you only have eight of 3,400 books, children's books, written by native authors. Um, and this statistic is kind of interesting in picture books for children, talking bears outnumber Native Americans nine to one. And so it's this critical question of exposure. How much are students learning? How much are they exposed through the media choices of teachers or in their home? And then we have representation of American Indians in the media at large. So a lot of people, um, especially my age and a little bit older and the generation above will say, what are some of the go-to Indian movies? And um, every once in a while you get somebody who tosses out smoke signals, which is kind of a more modern American Indian movie. But most of the time you get people talking about Dance with Bulls, Last of the Mohicans types of movies. And so um, basically the representation of American Indians continues in the media surrounding children. So they go to school, they learn these things and the media surrounding them, they learn these things as well. This stuck in the past imagery is also represented in mascots. And I'm not gonna go down the mascot rabbit hole today, but I think it's really important to understand that the mascot situation is directly connected to these other things where it's all about what are people learning? And um, we find that American Indian children and non-American Indian children do not learn much. Therefore, they do not have a, um, grand ideas of what American Indians can be. And that includes American Indian kids trying to think, what am I going to be when I grow up? They don't have exposure to um, things, many things beyond this, these images in their schools or in the media. And I think this, I think one story that I like to share kind of sums this up. I was um, when people find out my last name's Red Corn, there's a lot of questions that come with it, especially since I passed for white. Um, and um, they were like, oh, where's that name come from? And I said, oh, it's an Osage name, um, blah, blah, blah. We, conversation continues. I'm kind of used to having this conversation. And she, she turns around and she says, oh, I thought the Osage were extinct. 
And I think this is a really important thing to think about, about this lack of representation of the contemporary Indian in our world, in our education world especially, um, leads people to believe that natives are extinct and they don't exist anymore. For example, a lot of people who grew up in Kansas, went to Kansas schools, may have learned about the state of Kansas being named after the Kaw people or the Kanza people. Um, many don't know that when they leave schools. And then they also um, don't realize that the Kaw Nation is still in Oklahoma and they still exist and they own land in Kansas still where they have certain gatherings and things like that. And so their ongoing presence is invisible to most people. Therefore, people assume that these native nations are extinct. They don't know that there's 574 federally recognized tribes right now. So a lot of the work I do is about how do our education infrastructures and status quo perpetuate these stereotypes um, and these status quo. And so um, if we look at Kansas specifically, we can look at our Kansas history and government social studies standards. And, and we're having conversations with the Kansas State Department of Education and the Board of Education about how can we improve this context. So this is an ongoing conversation and um, this has been pointed out and there's, there's work, there's active work right now to resolve some of these issues. But if all we do is a rudimentary keyword analysis of those state standards, so this is what people are supposed to learn about American Indians in the state of Kansas. Now we could get into like the standards versus local decisions about what how those standards are unfold. That's kind of a, a state curriculum conversation that I'm not sure everybody wants to get into here. But if you just Google this big old document that's supposed to guide social studies education in the state, Native Americans, the term, shows up 14 times in Kansas history, government, and social studies standards. And 11 of those appearances show up under these headings. And if you notice, ancient times to the 1400s, 1000s to the 1600s, 1600s to the 1760s, up to 1830, and up to 1900. And then the term indigenous shows up with the title 7000 BCE to 1854. And the phrase American Indian doesn't exist in the document. Um, but as you can see, we're falling into that same trap in the state of Kansas. And so how can we kind of disrupt that status quo? And if we think about native nations that are historic to Kansas that currently reside in Oklahoma because of forced removals, the, the word Kansa shows up twice in the entire document. The words Osage, Pawnee, Kiowa, Comanche, Potawatomi, Kickapoo, Sac and Fox, and Iowa are not mentioned at all in the entire document. So that invisibility is really important to wrap our heads around because that invisibility is what props up these stereotypes. And we also, there's a study out of 2021 that talks about there are 14 states in the nation that have no learning in their standards that emphasizes people to learn about tribal sovereignty. So a lot of people, when you, when they, uh, when they say the terms tribal sovereignty, they're like, oh yeah, it's that kind of special thing uh, that Indians have because they have a casino. And so there's no depth to where that comes from. And there's no um, discussions around what that means and where, where it all, how it all manifests in a contemporary environment. For example, these, gov these tribal governments have governmental structures that um, kids could learn from, just like they learn about a local school board council or uh, a local city council or the state constitution and these things. These tribal governments have those documents that could be studied in a current context. So this invisibility really is one of the big issues we have in all of our learning environments for our children. And I like to kind of flip this and ask people, take a moment to consider that over the course of your lifetime, the great majority of what you learned about white people was through the image of a Civil War soldier. Clearly, we have more that we've learned from. Um, there, are, there are ongoing interactions on a day-to-day -day basis. There are textbooks cover up to modern times and we have ongoing development of media that sheds light on the complexity of what it means to be um, different versions of white in different regions of the United States. So we have more details, but the problem is our students aren't necessarily getting these details about American Indians. So they're stuck with that image and that's what they're kind of left with and it hangs. But it's really important that we also emphasize that I'm not saying don't teach American Indian history. It's about balance and the idea that um, we have balance where we're out of balance. And I probably should have put this as actually in balance because our, 
our students and our um, day to day interaction with ongoing media and, and things like that balances out um, what it means to be a modern white person versus what it means to be a, um, a white person in the 1800s. Um, we recognize those differences. Those differences aren't as easily um, parsed out when it comes to American Indians. So the fundamental questions I tend to tackle are how do we ensure our citizens learn about the contemporary American Indian? How do we ensure our citizens know that Native nations with history in Kansas still exist in contemporary form, most of them being in Oklahoma? And are, are our teachers and educators required to learn about contemporary American Indians? And um, some states require this for teacher certification education degrees. So that's kind of stuff I do in the field. But fundamentally, like what we're talking about here, and this could be with museums as well, even though it seems like museums are geared towards history, the fundamental question is where is the modern representation of indigenous peoples and this is the part where i start um taking some of my brother's pictures and, and putting them on the internet um so people know he's a pretty good photographer um and so uh yeah so this is like this type of imagery is what just plain and simple our students and our kids and our adults need more exposure to so they can add pixels and nuance to what it means to be a modern american indian and the fundamental question we're working with is also, how do we change the narrative? How do we change these narratives? And what I urge people to do in all the things they do, this isn't just educators, this is parents, this is um, museum curators, this is all these people is, we need to connect the past to the present. There's this big fat disconnect where we learn all about histories, sometimes inaccurate histories, actually a lot of times inaccurate histories that are focused on indigenous peoples, um, but we're not connecting that to the present. So if you're in a classroom or you're in a museum or you're a parent and you're like, hey, let's learn about the history of this place and you find out, oh, the Osage or the Kaw people or the Kiowa people, a simple internet search will find they're a tribal government with a tribal website and they have a history tab and a culture tab where you can learn about these people in the present. And it's not even that complicated. You're going straight to the horse's mouth. Those are those people representing themselves. So um, connect the past to the present and um, our histories are still unfolding. We're not just a past tense people and we're a forward thinking people. And this is something that I, I get strongly from um, my Osage uh, relatives um, is that um, a lot of Osages, will, when talking about tradition, um, you hear a lot of them talk about how we're forward thinking people, like forward thinking and ongoing adaptation and movement forward is part of our tradition. And so that's the antithesis of this stuck in the past stereotype that we often deal with. And so um, in thinking about this, I like to point to at Kansas State University, um, Uncle Mo or Mogri Lookout is the Osage language master teacher. He's one of our um, most cherished elders in the Osage community. And he got an honorary doctorate from um, the College of Education at Kansas State University um, last December. And it was it was great. And one of the fundamental or one of the main reasons he did that is because he was instrumental in the revival of the Osage language. And this alphabet you see on the screen that you also saw in my introduction, he led the development of that. And he will also share that credit. He says, this took a lot of people, but um, most people in the community know that he led that, that process because we had uh, we were dealing with English phonetics, trying to, um, uh, trying to recreate Osage sounds with English phonetics. And he bypassed and said, let's stop trying to do that. Let's create our phonetics that represent our sounds in, in our language. And so this is a form of what I would call intellectual sovereignty and this ongoing adaptation and moving forward. Um, and the idea that this work has led to the development of apps. So you learn about Osages and their history in Kansas and things like that, but a lot of people don't know that the Osage have redeveloped this orthography in the last 20 years. The language department's somewhere around 20 years old, and he was the first leader of the language department. And um, we got it in, or they helped get it in the language department, did a whole lot of work over a long period of time to get it into Unicode. So now Osages can text each other in this orthography, and they can um, upload to Facebook and post on Facebook for these things. So this is the story of ongoing resilience in the Osage Nation. And so while we have history here, also I point out 
things like the Osage Nation plans to develop a $60 million Lake of the Ozarks casino. Like these casinos are generating funds to do this, to revitalize our language. And casinos aren't the only um, enterprise that tribes engage in. For example, the Osage Nation bought 40,000 acre ranch and um, they're now running cattle on it and they have their own butcher house um, or we have our own butcher house. And so um, these are the types of things that people don't necessarily learn about. They tend to get that stuck in the past imagery. And I'm the guy that sometimes puts a wet blanket on Little House on the Prairie. And this is not negating that that version of the story happened. But what people don't understand is Little House on the Prairie is actually the story of Osage removal. And the story of Osage removal is tied to the decline in the Osage language. And so they were squatters on Osage land. And um, that the incoming influx, when you hear the, our land acknowledgement talk about stolen land, the incoming influx of white settlers who ignored um, treaty obligations and came in anyway and settled on lands and removed the Osage um, ultimately to make way for Kansas to become a state. So the, the removal of the Osage is directly correlated with the founding of Kansas as a state. And so People kind of end the story there, but the removal to Oklahoma doesn't mean that the Osage stopped existing. And one of the things that came out of that era is a ceremony that we still practice um, every June. And it's a really important part of our um, future. And um, while I won't get into the details of the ceremony, it's really um, how Osages are trying to move deep cultural values forward um, into this complex existence um, surrounded by settlers. And as you can see, I am a product of both white settlers and um, the Osage community. So did the kill the Indian, save the man, a similist approach ever stop in Indian education? I think that's a really important question that I grapple with. Um, so if anybody doesn't know what I'm talking about, so boarding schools in the late 1800s, um, well, actually throughout the 1800s, Kansas was one of the main places that boarding schools happened because it was Indian territory. And the idea was take the Indian out of the man, forced assimilation. You're not allowed to speak your language. You're not allowed to practice your spiritual practices or your religious practices. And Haskell Indian Nations University started as one of the early boarding school, um, I'll call it experiments. And so you see this picture of the Haskell babies. Um, fast forward over time though, and Haskell now has a different purpose. So while it was set up to destroy Indian culture and um, move American Indians into a Eurocentric way of living and agrarian farming and things like that. What happened was um, it actually evolved to be a place where those cultures are embraced because American Indians continued to push um, for sovereignty and for say in the education of their people. Um, and when the American government signed treaties, they made promises to the American Indian nations that they would, they would um, provide education. And so those promises still exist, just like people still believe in the Constitution of the United States. Um, there are deep legal principles um, that we can't, we don't have time to hash out here, that um, made promises to these people. And that's why Haskell as a federal Indian boarding school still exists. But what a lot of people don't realize is that this is an ongoing story. There's a lot of people in Kansas that drive past Haskell Indian Nations University and see that, that um, in Lawrence, they see that stadium which has a ton of history, if you ever get a chance to look into the history of that stadium. But they see that and they don't ever actually know what's going on there. And this is really important because what a lot of people learn is this right here in the textbook, this isn't a lot of textbooks, all right? And this pre-1900 version of the American Indian experience is kill the Indian, save the man, assimilate. It's not in some textbooks though, but Haskell goes on. And they're still graduating people and there's still a place. And I've heard numerous people talk about what they received at Haskell is something that other, other universities can't touch. And so um, it's a place for community building. It's a really important place to Indian country. And it's inherently tied to the founding of Kansas, the history of Kansas. And um, it puts Kansas on the map in Indian country. There are people that come from Alaska to go to Haskell. And so that's a really important part of the Kansas historical um, narrative. But we have this question, where is the contemporary Indian? So I'm gonna bore you with some educational statistics, but one of the issues we're running into is that most American Indians, when you're dealing with student data, 
So we have American Indians who mark American Indian, Alaskan Native. They check that box. But then we have this whole contingent of people like me who also check another box. And then they get, quote unquote, lost in multiracial. In Kansas, 63% of American Indian students are lost in multiracial. And so what I'm go getting at is they don't look, not all Native Americans look like the people that we think that stereotype looks like. And um, we could spend an entire two years unpacking like the complications that come with that and the degrees of indigeneity and the belonging of citizenship from one tribe to another tribe. Um, but plain and simple, where's the contemporary Indian? I have to talk to a lot of teachers and educators and say, they're in your classrooms and you don't realize it because they don't look like that stereotype. And that's a really important layer to, to come away with here. Um, and if you look at the demographics of Kansas, when you look at, this is by school district, when you look at students who check American Indian Alaska Native, they're in almost every single school district in the state of Kansas, period. So they're across the state. They're not just near the reservations, they're across the state. And when you unlock students who also chose white, remember we had this kill the Indian, save the man policy for years or for generations. Um, if the goal was assimilation, then why are we surprised that Native Americans are, are heavily integrated into other races? And so when you unlock American Indian white, there, the numbers go up. And so these communities that are not necessarily all near reservations are places where you have a lot of mixed race ancestry. So they don't all look like that stereotype, even in modern form. And to keep pushing that stereotype and keep kind of disrupting it, um, American Indians and African Americans are also an important demographic to think about. And um, in almost every district in Kansas, you have people choosing American Indian and African American. So once again, these stereotypes are not holding true to the modern complicated context that we all inherited. But yet at the same time, just because this American Indian student checks African American or checks white does not mean that they don't also have citizenship with their tribal nation. And so our American Indian existence is getting, um, is complicated, but it's also something that promises were made to these nations and the descendants of these people are still holding true to um, the continuation of those communities. We also have new people and new positions of power. So I'm hoping that that Google exercise that I did early is going to slightly shift over the years because we have more exposure and more media gaining attention in places of power. And so Deb Holland and the Secretary of Interior, the first and the Secretary, for people that don't understand the bureaucracy of Indians, like the Secretary of Interior oversees the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And so this is the first time you have an American Indian overseeing the main federal entity that oversees the management of um, the federal trust relationship between American Indians and the federal government. You also have in politics aside, like um, Sharice Davis uh, writing a book talking about like, hey, I'm a modern American Indian woman. Um, and I, in the book, she's like doing Kung Fu moves because she was an MMA, uh, amateur MMA fighter and she's doing all these things. And so, um, she's breaking those stereotypes just by being present in those spaces and writing these books and talking about, hey, you're an American Indian kid and you're growing up and you're reading books. Look, here's somebody that actually kind of overlaps and intersects with your understanding of the world. And so I think this is a really important development to have more books like this. And this is directly tied to Kansas. Again, politics aside, this, this book is not political. It's just um, an opportunity to show people um, the, the modern American Indian. You also have shows showing up by um, like Reservation Dogs in Rutherford Falls. And um, I believe Rutherford Falls after two seasons is um, is possibly in limbo right now. But um, this is an important development because Native people get to see themselves in modern context. And more than that, um, there are still lots of shows out there that fall into the kind of stuck in the past stereotype. But more than that, these shows have Native writers in the writing room. And so for a long time, you have non-Native academics talking about what Indians are and what they believe. And for a long time in the media, you have non-Indian people um, making movies about Indians without their input. And fast forward into modern times, now in the, only the last couple of years, you have shows like this that have Native directors, they have Native writers, and Reservation Dogs especially is an all-Native writing room. It's basically all-Native cast, all-Native writing room. Um, so, so um, as we kind of, as I'm kind of trying to emphasize, like 
native people there's there's kind of a a reckoning going on in the media the curriculum there's all kinds of stuff going on in the last um three to five years you're starting to see more so this this ball is moving forward and um it's evolving a little bit but it's important to let people know like there are other media options so instead of little house on the prairie which i know is really important to a lot of kansas uh, nostalgia um understanding that there's, there's alternative stories like the birch bark house um understanding that there are native young adult novels um, out there for for native youth to read and not just um, children's books but young adult novels and there's really important stories to to make visible such as um the Njujo wakobe story about um the rock and robinson um and robinson park is a sacred um rock and this story this was developed called between a rock and a hard place where it was a sacred prayer rock for the Kaw people and settlers took it out of the river and um, commemorated the founding and put their own plaque on it um, after the call were removed. And so this story is really important because it's the ongoing story. And right now the city of Lawrence and the call nation are figuring out how to transport this back to the call people. And so it's not just a story of like, oh man, our past is messed up. It's also a story of um, let's be honest about these things and let's recognize that the call nation still exists and we can engage in conversation and try to at least find um, some common ground and moving forward in some topics in some areas. So this is a really important story to make visible. And especially when we talk about museums, it's really important to make visible the Native American Graves and Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. So people call it NAGPRA. And this is just the ongoing story of, um, for a long time, American Indian burials were okay to just excavate and put in museums while non-American Indian um, graveyards were not touched. That was seen as not okay. And so um, starting in the, um, around 1990, you start getting federal laws that say, hey, we need to think about this and this problematic history. And if you have native people's bones sitting in your museum and you have native artifacts sitting in your museum um, they may have been improperly taken and th there needs to be a process for returning them to those people and so these are just the ongoing modern context for which a lot of people don't necessarily learn about and they don't take time and they haven't been taught these things and Overall, I hope my main message today is this, this idea of exploring alternative perspectives to Kansas history and thinking about the concept that Kansas history and bleeding Kansas and everything is like right smack dab in the middle of this story of American progress. Um, but while one perspective might see it as Western expansion, um, others might see it as Western invasion and exploitation. But um, Native communities didn't just disappear. Um, they've continued to endure and under terrible circumstances. And um, while we all inherited these histories, thinking about how um, we can address these entanglements and, and just plain talk about these entanglements is how we start figuring out um, the next chapters of Kansas history. And I think that's a really important message that I'm trying to convey today is, um, being honest and engaging in these topics and engaging in these conversations, because there are things found in American Indian communities that were ignored for a long time that might hold um, power to um, help us all progress forward. So um, with that, I just want to say way now and thank you very much for your time. And uh, it looks like we still have some time for some questions. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Redcorn. That was that was awesome. I, I can't wait to go back through and uh, and listen to it again. <laughs> um, all right. Well, yeah, we've got we've got a couple questions here, and definitely everybody uh, as they keep rolling in, feel free to use either the chat or the uh, the Q and A to pose those questions. Um, so you you said something that that kind of uh, piqued piqued my interest about the number of boarding schools in Kansas. Uh, does Kansas have more like per area than most of the other states? So I'm not a historian, but um, yes, I would say Kansas is going to have more than a lot of states, but not every state. There are some states that have even more. Um, but so it, recently, if anybody who's curious, because of the um, the mass graves that were found in Canada, 
um, this, this movement of every child matters and trying to find, okay, use our technology to find these mass graves at residential schools in Canada, the boarding schools in, in the United States. Um, there's a lot of effort right now to, to confront our boarding school histories and there's a report. So there's a federal report that came out last spring and it walks through a lot of history and things like that. But um, one of the things that's in there is it has a list and Kansas is listed as having 12 federal boarding schools. And so um, that's just the federal schools, though. So what you're not necessarily counting in there are all the religious missions that came into these communities. And so there's also religious missionary schools as well. So I don't know the exact number, um, but it's it's higher because we had so many tribes that were here and so many tribes that were moved through. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Rose asked if you are familiar with the book Killers of the Flower Moon. Yes, and that's like that's the go to if you haven't heard of the Osage Nation, um, it's about to be even more pronounced. So flowers, killers of the flower moon. Um, so there's a book called The Deaths of Sybil Bolton. And my um, uncle Charles Redcorn also wrote a book called A Pipe for February that has talked about the Osage oil murders and in, in certain types of ways in that era in Osage history. So um, Yes, I'm very familiar with the book. And so Killers of the Flower Moon by David Green um, came out a few years back and it has like amplified everything. And for anybody that doesn't know, it's about the Osage oil murders and the corresponding development of the FBI um, for handling um, crimes. And so uh, long story short is when the Osage were removed. So the Little House on the Prairie story is the story of Osage removal. When the Osage were removed to Oklahoma, they bought their land. Um, so our, our ancestors said, we're not doing this treaty, treaty negotiation the same way. We're going to buy the deed. And so we, we have deed to the land. That then said, okay, now it's communal property ownership. Fast forward, oil is found. And so basically the tribe still has the minerals estate. Um, and um, they started getting quarterly payments and white people started marrying Osages and killing them and trying to figure out how to get access to that the share of the minerals estate. That's very much the fast forward version for any listeners that aren't aware, but it's about to be a movie by Mark Scorsese with Leonardo DiCaprio and Robert De Niro. And so there's going to be a lot of attention on it. I will say um, for anybody that's interested in that, there's another layer that just came out like last week. Um, look for the podcast in trust. And it outlines that and it's walking through another layer of the story, which um, yeah. So. Awesome. Uh, by chance, do you know about uh, like the native representation that's going to be in that film? Will there be a pretty big role? Yes. So I, I'm holding my opinions till I see it because this <laughs> okay. is like a really important story that that Martin Scorsese, Leonardo DiCaprio, and Robert De Niro like are trying to amplify. And I will say that by all appearances, it seems like they've really tried to go about this the right way, um, tried to make sure that their movie is benefiting the community, even using local catering um, from the Osage Nation uh, butcher house type stuff and um, consulting with local people. And um, my, <laughs> there's two red corns in the movie and um, <laughs> one of them, so uh, Yancey red corn and Tali red corn are, um, I'll call them my uncles, but we can get off to a cultural protocol, but um, they're the uh, the chief in the tribe and the political chief and one of the cultural leaders. And there's also other red corns that show up as extras. And actually, my my they rented our uh, family dishes, so I, I'm looking forward to seeing my family dishes and uh, and that. I don't know, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, all right. Well, we and wait. actually, I pro should probably say, so my great grandfather um, was mentioned in that book. And so um, he was one of the mysterious deaths that happened that was never resolved. And so, yeah. All right. Well, everybody, you heard you heard it here. You got to go pick up a, a copy of the book and uh, check it out in anticipation for the film. Um, here's a kind of a question that I can answer real quick, but some kudos to you. Uh, Hi, Professor Redcorn, your talk is amazing and illuminating. Is this talk recorded? I have an artist friend who would learn so much from your talk for his current project. Thank you. Uh, and yes, it is. So we live stream all of these to YouTube. Uh, so here right after the talk uh, is finished, 
it'll be available on YouTube and we archive all of them as well. Uh, and you, you got a playlist. So if you're feeling really uh, museum after hours uh, heavy, then go through it all. I think we have like more than 20. So <laughs> all right. we have a whole week's worth of entertainment. Um, okay, so uh, another, uh, another question. Uh, what was the creation of the written Osage language like? That just sounds fascinating. So that's definitely like a, I, I was not integral in any of it. I just, um, I wanted to make sure um, I had an opportunity to try to honor Uncle Moog at Kansas State University. And honestly, it made me real nervous because I was like, he's a very respected elder. And I was like, I, I don't know if he even wants this and wants this attention, but um, a lot of people around him was like, no, this guy deserves this type of attention. So he got his honorary doctorate. Um, so I can't really speak to the story. All I can say is, watching it from afar um, come, and come together and trying to learn it and seeing like, okay, now we're actually getting consistent spelling. Um, so what would happen before is you'd, you'd have, you'd get like four different spellings of a word and you just have to like say it to guess what it is. And so we're just not getting to the point where you're getting more consistent spellings across different um, things. And uh, yeah, so it's still a learning process, but uh, to be able to text it and put it on, Facebook and things like that is really kind of a powerful thing because now it's a curricular backbone um, and I'm still trying to learn it um, and it's it's not easy and uh, but it's just one of those things that you just got to keep pressing on and and I go through waves where I make more progress than other times but well, that's awesome <laughs> um, I have a, a comment from Karen here uh, while transcribing Indian school records for Springfield, Missouri at the National Archives, I was surprised how far some of the students traveled to the school. Dakotas, many very young. Um, yeah, so um, I'm not a historian, so I got to be careful not to project too much. But basically, um, part of the goal was to get them away from their families. And so um, the further away you could get them, whether... Um, so for example, the most infamous school um, was Carlisle. So Carlisle is in Pennsylvania. So at this time, Pennsylvania is not exactly the, the Indian Mecca of the world. Really, uh, Kansas and Oklahoma had a lot of tribes removed from the East. So um, Carlisle, Pennsylvania was a way to kind of get them out there. And there were a lot of Osages that went to Carlisle. Um, and so it's kind of tricky because there's this, there's this like balance between Hey, you must send your kids here, or or we need to get your kids here and get them and and um, abandon those old ways and and kind of um, strip them of their culture kind of thing. That was there, but you also had people that were like, okay, um, you need to go to the school because you need to figure out how this world operates, so we can we can figure out how to negotiate, navigate, and survive in this world. And so there, there were Osages that were pushing, go get educated, um, not because we want you to lose your culture and forget who you are, um, but let some of this go so you can go learn this stuff. And that's when people, um, that's when Osages learn how to do things like come back and negotiate treaty rights and then say like, hey, we want the deed to this and you want us to divide up our land. We've seen how it went for these other people. I've read about it. I've heard about it. And I know we have these authorities in this place and things like that. And so um, it's, it's, it's a deep story that people need to di kind of dive in. Um, it's not really a great chapter in American history, but for American Indian nations trying to survive with the, the, the draw that they were given, um, it's a lot of negotiation that happens um, trying to figure out this. And there's also, I kind of, there's one, like when I read some of the Osage histories about Osage and boarding schools, sometimes I feel like I'm reading between the lines where they're like making political moves. Like, yeah, no, no, you can bring that school in here. Yeah, go ahead. And you're going to give us this, right? Okay, cool. Then we're negotiating. All right. And uh, kids go to the school and then like, Oh yeah, oh, you don't want to stay at that school? Okay, come on home, and then the school doesn't survive. So there's <laughs> there's a little bit of political negotiation. That's what I, one takeaway I hope people have is that um, natives weren't just like rolling over, like oh man, we're just so poor and sad and helpless. No, there was like strategic decision making and negotiation going on um, from natives as they're trying to negotiate their situation. 
and I think that that's a story that needs to be told much more frequently than it is now because that's that's not really what I think most most school children get when learning about um, mm -hmm. American Indians. Um, I, I was particularly interested when you when you brought up the state standards. Um, do you have any recommendations on uh, how to kind of massage the state standards? Would I mean we've got the the five core uh, Kansas social studies standards. Would Would you like to see maybe an additional standard added to to deal with uh, American Indian representation and in history, or or maybe m more fleshed out in the uh, appendix uh, further down on the document? Any? Well, that's, those are the conversations we're having. I'm, I'm just so happy to hear that somebody's really excited to hear me unpacking the social studies <laughs> theories. Um, but uh, we have a couple ideas on the table. Um, when I say we, there's a new group called the Kansas uh, Advisory Council for Indigenous Education. And so um, we're tackling this question right now. And um, there's a couple ideas on the table, but one of the most obvious things to do is the appendices that you're talking about. So for anybody that's in the room that doesn't know, you get the core standards and you got the appendices. Uh, we've talked about how a lot of teachers kind of bypass those core standards sometimes and go to the appendices and look for more specific um, stuff. And so um, we're trying to attack professional development of teachers, appendices, and all the standards, but um, we have a couple strategies in mind and it's not, it's not articulate enough right now to kind of make public, but we're working on it. That's awesome. I'm, I'm very, very excited. You'll have to keep me posted and I'll, I'll keep checking. Will do. Uh, uh, could you repeat the name of the podcast you mentioned? Um, it's, a uh, here, I think I can type it in there, right? In trust. Perfect. It's from, uh, Bloomberg. And it's in your, uh, I've seen it in uh, Spotify and also Apple Podcasts. And I, I tell everybody that. I guess I just sent that to um, one. All right, everybody. Uh, Karen asked for the appendices. Um, I dropped the, the, the whole document in, uh, <laughs> in the chat. Uh, be prepared because it is quite long, but uh, you can just scroll down. It's, let's see, about page starts on page 19. Um, it's, yeah, it's kind of the the last five sixths of the document. Like it's, <laughs> it's really most the document. Um, let's see, uh, Joseph asks, can you speak about the Osage ribbon shirt? Um, so Osage ribbon shirt, um, this can mean a few things. So I'm not so a ribbon shirt is simply um, the shirt we wear during our tribal dances. And so it's uh, typically going to be like most ribbon shirts, especially during the Elanchka in the Osage community, are going to be long sleeve ribbon shirts. And that's just that's just a typical shirt that most families will go out and find patterns they like. That I mean, it's, there's nothing overly sacred about some of the, uh, like the patterns they choose. They're like, oh, it's kind of a cool shirt. Um, but uh, that's just something we wear um, in that. And you can, in the first slides of my, um, of my presentation, I had a ribbon shirt on. Um, might also, I don't know if uh, it's also into, uh, if, if the question is also asking about ribbon work. Um, Osage ribbon work is kind of a different thing. That is the applique cutting and folding of ribbons to certain patterns and, and, um, and color profiles that go on our broadcloth suits um, that people wear. And it goes on lots of other things, but ribbon work is, um, if you get some certain Osages in the community talking about ribbon work, you uh, the Osage feel like we're, we can be a little Osage centric sometimes. And um, we feel like we're the best, we, when I say we, not me, the Osage community is the best at ribbon work in all the land. So. <laughs> All right. Well, I think I think that about does it. All right. We just got got a couple more that rolled in. Uh, da, da, da. Do we know if K State has a plan to do more to promote its Native Nation students and graduates? Um, sorry. One more time. I was looking at. Uh, oh, the last one. Do we know if K State has a plan to do more to promote its Native Nation? Oh. We are working on it on a lot of ways. So um, we are really hoping to 
Well, there's a few fronts. So our Indigenous Peoples Day Conference and the creation of our Indigenous Faculty Staff Alliance at K-State is meant to try to create a community and to help connect students to faculty. Um, but there's also the Native American student body. And so those two things are talking to each other a lot and connecting a lot. But we're also trying to do things like um, there's a grant program out of the College of Ag um, and actually out of the vet school that's trying to get more Native students into Ag and vet, um, vet position or vet jobs um, coming out of or coming out of high school and into college. Um, and there's also uh, an ongoing effort to recognize, hey, we got this land grant status and this land grant history, which a lot of people would refer to as land grab. And um, why are we asking Native Americans to pay tuition when their land is what is funding all of the property taxes and a fund of the founding of these institutions. And so it's not necessarily asking for like, hey, I'm a free ride because of this, but it's like, no, like the logic of the land was that, like they've already paid their tax. And so the descendants of these people were, were working, which actually take up a small percentage of the entire student population, trying to get reduced uh, tuition um, opportunities for them. That's just something we're working on um, daily. Fantastic. Well, well thank, thanks for that question, Joe, and thanks for your response, Dr. Redcorn. Um, was there any uh, indigenous uh, participation in the Keeper of the Plains uh, statue in Wichita? You know, I don't know enough about that statue. Um, I would assume so because there's an Indian center in Wichita that's pretty active, um, the Mid-America Indian Center. And um, I, I would be very surprised if they weren't somehow involved in that. However, I don't know for sure. Um, it's just right across the river from the statue, right? Yeah, and I actually haven't, I haven't been to the statue for some reason. And like, yeah, I've joked around about there's this imaginary divide between like the Wichita <laughs> side of the state and the other side of the state that why, why aren't, why isn't there more going on between Kansas City and Wichita? So anyway. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much, Dr. Redcorn. This has been awesome. Uh, I've learned a ton. Um, and uh, hopefully everyone here, whether or not they're, you know, educators uh, have learned a, a great deal about how to think about contemporary American Indians. Um, well, I hope everybody can join us next week uh, to come watch our very own Lauren Gray of the State Archives present next month's spooky program, The Art of Dying, Reflections on Death in 19th Century America. You'll hear stories of body snatching, live burials, embalming, and much more just in time for Halloween. So from all of us here at Museum After Hours, have a wonderful evening, and we will see you all again very soon.